Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here, we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. Hey there, my name is Mike, and my passion for bird watching has escorted me into some of the prettiest forests in the world. Yet my strange encounter occurred in my hometown of San Bernardino. It happened in the mountains on a beautiful spring day in 2004. I had been hiking for about an hour when I decided to take a break and sit on a shaded boulder. I was sitting there, enjoying the serenity, when I heard a noise behind me. I turned around and saw something that I couldn't believe. Standing in the middle of the trail was what looked like a hairy, naked human, but it was hunched like a chimpanzee. It had long, black hair. It took me a moment to realize it had a dead rattlesnake in its hands. The snake was still writhing around, and the Sasquatch appeared fascinated. I was so shocked that I couldn't move. I then noticed an awful stench, similar to rotten eggs, but more pungent. Strangely, that was when the creature looked at me and smiled before turning its attention back to the rattlesnake. It swung the snake around for a few more moments before tossing it into the air. The reptile flew high above its head before landing on the ground with a thud. The Sasquatch would then pick it up and start all over again. I would have felt terrible for the snake had I not been so stunned by the scene. I soon realized I had to be looking at a Sasquatch, for nothing else made sense. I watched the Sasquatch play with the frightened, exhausted snake for a bit longer until it got bored and threw the snake off a nearby cliff. There was no possibility of it surviving that fall. The small Sasquatch then turned and trotted off with the posture of a proud dog. Before I knew it, it was no longer in sight. I sat there for a few minutes to process what I had just seen. I couldn't believe that I had actually seen a Sasquatch. I'd always assumed they were mythical making the sight a devastating discovery. I was still shocked while walking back to my vehicle, but also excited that I'd learned the truth. I had just seen something that most people would never see in a lifetime. I drove home and told my wife what I had seen. I've never seen a Sasquatch since then, but I'll never forget the day I did. It was a mind-blowing experience. Heck, it still is. I know some people might not believe me, but I'm just an avid bird watcher who happened to be in the right place at the right time. I hope I'll see another Sasquatch in a safe setting, but the chances are as slim as they get. Sasquatch are highly elusive, but I'll always keep my eyes open. On to the next one. 
Growing up in a rural pocket of Pennsylvania, my childhood was a collection of classic Americana memories, especially the idyllic summers on our family farm. Yet, what sticks out the most are not the typical hayrides, sweet corn, or even the magnificent fireflies that came alive at twilight. No, what haunts me to this day is a series of inexplicable, unsettling encounters with otherworldly beings that I can neither identify nor forget. The first time I crossed paths with these entities, I was just ten. Recently recovered from a bout of nasty stomach flu, my body clock was entirely off kilter, sleep eluding me that fateful night. My bedroom was spacious, designed to accommodate myself and my two older sisters, both of whom were sound asleep. Not wanting to disturb them, I quietly made my way to a cushioned alcove that housed a large, picturesque window overlooking our farm and the adjacent woodland. Clutching my favorite novel on a flashlight, I settled down. That night, the moon was a radiant sphere, filling the room with an almost supernatural luminosity, rendering my flashlight unnecessary. I tried to immerse myself in the book, but kept catching fleeting movements in my peripheral vision. When I looked, nothing seemed amiss, and I blamed it on the lingering illness or perhaps a trick of the light. Finally, my curiosity overpowered me, and I focused my gaze intently on the spot near the tree line where I thought I had seen something stir. It took only a few moments for a sense of palpable dread to sink into my bones. My skin prickled as if stung by a hundred nettles. The alcove, my haven of tranquility, now felt like a cage. And then I saw them, four grotesque beings, standing in a tight cluster near the woods. They were impossibly tall, maybe twelve to fifteen feet, their bodies elongated and skeletal as if constructed from rubber. Their anatomy defied all earthly logic, with their torsos were almost concave, an eerie hollow where their stomachs should be. In the moonlight, their forms cast sinister silhouettes. It was difficult to see facial features, but They appeared to have the basic structure of eyes, nose, and mouth. What arrested my attention were the horns. Each creature possessed them, thick and formidable, each unique in its curvature and spiral, terminating in what seemed like a vicious point. In that paralyzing moment, they seemed engrossed in some sort of conversation. Gesturing toward the treetops, with their abnormally long, sinewy arms. Then, as if sensing my presence, all four twisted their heads in unison and stared directly at me. Their faces, previously unclear, seemed twisted in sadistic glee. The air grew heavy, almost suffocating. Terrified, I bolted from my bed, cocooned myself in my quilt, and prayed for morning. The next day, my father casually mentioned something that turned my blood cold. Birds' nests, even owls, everything that lived in the trees had been massacred. Blood-drained, bodies scattered under the very trees the creatures had been near. I kept silent, knowing my stoic father wouldn't tolerate tales of nocturnal monsters. Over the years, I've had numerous encounters with these inexplicable beings, each time chipping away my skepticism and fortifying my fear. The episode that remains most vivid happened when I was around 17 during an isolated afternoon fishing trip at a stream on our property. It was the eerie silence that initially unnerved me. No birds sang, no rustling leaves, just a deafening quiet. And then, as if summoned by my apprehension, they appeared again, only this time in full daylight. Their faces were the stuff of nightmares, 
mouths filled with serrated teeth, their eyes demonic, crimson with black flecks, almost glowing from their sunken sockets. I fled, and they chased. As I dashed through the forest, they materialized alongside me, their bodies wrapping like those inflatable, wacky waving tubemen you see at car sales events, always watching me. Even now, years later, and residing in a different state, I sense them. They're closing in, and my deepest fear is that someday, my own children or grandchildren might find one lurking under their bed or hiding in their closet. What they want or why they have fixated on me, I can't say. All I can do is hope. Time will bring us answers, or at least an end to these haunting visions. On to the next one. The first event happened when I was around five or six years old, a year or two before I moved to Ponce, Puerto Rico at age seven. At that time, I lived in the town of Quebradillas with my grandmother, God rest her soul. The town was mostly agrarian with farmers, dairy farmers and the like. Back then, and my uncle was a dairy farmer at the time. So I grew up those first years of my life around cows, chickens, and so on, and even raised chickens of my own as pets. They even watched cartoons with me, no joke. One fateful and sad and terrible morning, I went out to my pet chickens, as I did every other morning, only to find all but one dead. The cage was closed, and the cage mesh had not been broken yet. They were all dead, minus one that only survived for a few hours at best. They all had ghastly, circular wounds underneath their wings, yet no bleeding as if they had been drained of it. Needless to say, it left an impression at me that even to this day, at 53, I have not been able to shake. The second event took place in the late 1990s. My brothers and I were playing Jet Moto 2, that's a great game, on my junior brother's PlayStation. We had just finished playing at around 2 to 3 a.m., and Ricky, the youngest, had just gone to bed while Ryan and I had gone to the balcony when we heard a very loud howl as if a wolf was holding an amplifier like those the cops use at full blast to the point that it felt a bit reverberated inside one's body. It was that powerful. We both stood in silence for a little while before I said, what the F was that? Obviously, it chilled me to the bone as it was straight out of a horror movie to hear something like that. I half expected for a huge werewolf, just like in the movies, to come tear through the iron bars that surrounded the balcony and garage areas as if they were toothpicks and devour us both, I kid you not. The next morning, even my youngest brother said he heard it as he was falling asleep and thought he dreamed it until we spoke of it. Ryan tried to dismiss it as being my dog Kenny, the culprit, which was absurd, but I guess it was his way of coping with the unexplainable at that time. These are the two events as best as I can remember them. Other than what happened to those chickens, my memories of Quebradillas and my grandmother and my uncle and my cousins are the best memories of childhood that I've ever had. There is, I dare to say, something quasi-magical about the island's northeast or the karst region as they call it, with its mounds, sinkholes, and caves, and the impressive cliffs into the Atlantic, the Guarachaca train tunnel, which to this day some people purport to be haunted. On to the next one. We moved to Port Charlotte, Florida in June of 2015. Initially, the homes surrounding us were mostly vacant. During that time, I had two strange experiences. The first was around midnight. I had gone out to the Lanai to have a cigarette. As I stood up to go into the house, I began to smell this very powerful odor. It was a sweet, musky, skunky, weird smell I have never experienced before. I had the windows open, 
as it was during the cooler month. The smell emanated powerfully throughout the home for about 15 minutes before clearing. The second encounter was not long after. It was approximately 6 a.m. I was up getting my husband's lunch ready for work. Again, I was out on the lanai. I hear two owl calls coming from the neighborhood behind my house. They sounded strange, but I really don't pay it much mind. Then I heard what I can only describe as a great ape coming from the wooded lot down the street. It was very loud and deep. It was an ooh-ooh-ah-ooh-ooh ah, ooh, call. Hopefully I did it justice. I stood and walked over to the side of the yard and thought to myself, what the heck? Did the neighbors get a chimp? Both of these events happened in 2018. Since that time, the vacant homes have sold and are now occupied. I have not had any further experiences. Last night, I had commented on a Facebook post about these experiences that I had, just giving the location as Southwest Florida. A man replied asking where this happened. He lived in Port Charlotte and had a friend have very strange encounters. I messaged him and said I'm also in Port Charlotte and where I lived. He replied, and he's only a few blocks away. Apparently, his friend came into the house white as a ghost and absolutely terrified very early one morning. He told him he was not going to believe what he just saw, but in the center of the road near the wooded lot, he saw a four to five foot tall chimpanzee-like creature watching him. The man that I spoke with is a teacher and stated that his friend is not the type of person to fabricate stories. He said the man was literally shaking. That encounter was in about five years ago, to the best of his recollection. Our encounters were less than a mile away from each other. There have been several reports from Charlotte County, quite a few being in Port Charlotte. On to the next one. Near Morristown in British Columbia, a man and a woman were sitting at breakfast when they saw a black eight to nine foot tall Bigfoot walking across a field, then across the road. On to the next one. At Bella Coola in British Columbia, a woman and her children saw a female Bigfoot holding a youngster by the hand on a bank of the Bella Coola River. Also in Bella Coola, a Bigfoot along with two youngsters were seen. Was this the same as the other sighting in the same area, but the female Bigfoot had found another youngster or was it a different Bigfoot? On to the next one. My story begins in the summer of 1983 on the Sunshine Coast near Gibson in British Columbia, Canada. I was a resident leader at a YMCA camp at Langdale, about 20 kilometers north. My assistant, I have forgotten his name, myself and nine boys aged 10 and 11 left for an overnight hike up Tetra Hyden Ridge. Tet Ridge has been abandoned by the Mac Blow logging for a few years before and was awaiting reforestation. Consequently, the area had many five to 10 hectare clear cuts, which after leaving the logging road, we began to hike through. During these traverses, we, the assistant and I, began to get brief glimpses of a large black figure disappearing into the thick brush, either ahead of us or just to the side, left or right. It looked approximately eight to ten feet tall, although it was almost always uphill from us. As it was quite a ways off in the distance, we could never be sure if it was real or just our imagination playing tricks on us. 15-year-old boys have a large imagination, especially growing up hearing stories of Bigfoot and the like. It wasn't until we began seeing incredible large tracks and broken branches at the 8 or 9-foot level that we became worried. After at least five sightings during the afternoon hike, we started to contemplate returning to camp. We soon realized that we had hiked further than our turn mark around and would have to stay the night somewhere. We also became concerned that the management of the camp would not look favorable on us 
returning early with such a tall tale, scaring the kids needlessly. So we made camp almost at the summit of Tet Ridge and would finish the ascent in the morning. Dinner and the sing song that followed were uneventful. The only tense moment came when the campers or us had to use the latrine that we had constructed away from the camp and the large bonfire. We, the assistant and I, watched the campers like hawks, and after the last more had been eaten, sent our charges to bed. We stayed up to clean and stow the food properly in a tree. We banked the campfire and surrounding mountainside. It was unlike anything I have heard before or since, and the power behind them was disturbing. The sound seemed to be generated effortlessly. We had to reassure the boys many times and slept by the campfire, sitting back to back, debating the risk of hiking down in the dark. Finally, the sound stopped, and although we thought we heard something in the bush, about 200 meters below us, the rest of the longest night I've ever experienced finally came to an end. We broke camp after breakfast and completed our trek. Although we looked for tracks and any other signs during our hike back to camp, we did not see anything. We agreed not to tell anyone of this and began convincing the boys that they did not hear anything more than the howl of the wind, which most of them accepted dubiously. On to the next one. At Days Creek in Oregon, two young men hunting spotted a large, dark brown, almost black Bigfoot moving through the brush at a high rate of speed away from them. At the same time, a deer bolted from a nearby. David, who gave the report, said he thought the creature was after the deer. They, David and friend, had spooked out the deer by throwing rocks over the bank into the brush. It also startled the creature. It was also stated the creature was way too large to be a bear, and it pushed down trees as it tore through the brush. The entire encounter was 20 to 30 seconds. They were so startled by the encounter that they didn't look for tracks. They went to their car and left the area. There were no pictures or videos. On to the next one. In Kelso, Washington, in 1995, I was standing on my back porch looking towards the wood, which were a block down from my house. This section had been clear-cut and only stumps and very few trees were present. I saw something move and at first thought it was a bear. It took a few steps and stood there looking around. It seemed relaxed and just enjoying the view. I ran into my house and grabbed my camera with a telephoto lens. I zoomed in and realized it was not a bear. It was a Bigfoot, and its shoulders and arms were huge. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, realizing I didn't have any film in my camera. I watched a few more minutes because I wasn't sure I had extra film. I finally went back into the house for a short time, digging frantically for film, but was not lucky enough to find any. When I went back outside, it was gone. I was so creeped out, I went inside and locked the door. I wasn't sure if it saw me as well and was coming to get me. Funny thing is, my house was in the foothills of Mount St. Helen. I live in Kelso, Washington, right outside Longview, where I believe it was Paul Freeman who saw his first Bigfoot. My house was up a hill, on Ostander Road, at the end of my road, you could go into the woods and take trails all the way to Mount St. Helen. I don't have a doubt about what I saw. Even funnier, I think I saw one in Upper Michigan, in Hathaway Forest, when I was a teenager in the mid-80s. We were driving from a friend's cottage, and we saw one walking across the dirt road in front of our car. He stopped the car, and we watched it walk into the woods. There, we sat in silence for a few minutes. Then he looked at me and said, that was a darn Bigfoot. And we just laughed and were in awe that we never really talked about it after that. It's just unbelievable. 
I tell people I've seen Bigfoot, and they just laugh at me, and all I can do is laugh with them. What can you say? You really can't explain it. Anyway, I just wanted to report the sighting in Kelso, Washington, in the neighborhood of Rolling Wood, off of a standard road in the late summer of 1995. On to the next one. In Surrey, in North Carolina, I have never seen a Bigfoot, but I found large footprints in the mud in my yard. They were 15 inches long and 7 inches wide with toes on in April 16, 2014. On January 1, 2015, something was tapping on the back of my house. I went to check it out and I heard a loud scream that sounded like an elephant. I live in the foot of the mountain in North Carolina. On to the next one. It was about 1967 that Larry and I went out one night to feed his dogs. Once outside, he smelled a foul odor. When all at once, he sees a big, hairy creature that walked like a man, but was about nine feet tall. He told me the creature stepped over a wood fence. That fence was about six feet tall. Larry also told me that the creature growled or made a loud sound and swiped its arm like for him to get away. On to the next one. Kentucky Bigfoot. It was back in 2002. I was on the mountain gin singing. It was around 8 a.m., early October, on a clear morning, a very nice day. I was about two miles on Highway 92 from 25 East on Pine Mountain. I had covered a lot of ground, and all morning, I felt like I was being followed and could smell something that smelled like wet deer and a nasty wet dog smell all rolled into one. I could hear something walking ever so often, but could never see anything. About four hours later, I found a really nice four prone, and as I started digging in the brush behind me, the brush behind me started shaking like someone was there. I stood up and I heard a loud grunt, almost a growl, and it charged at me through the brush. I turned and ran down the mountain and into some three-inch tree, which I had trouble getting through. It was tight, but Whatever was behind me was big, and those trees did not stop it or slow it down. I could hear the trees snapping behind me. I came to a drop and looked, and I could see a logging road at the bottom. So I jumped out of fear, and it seemed as though I dropped forever. However, the way the mountain had been cut for the road, it was sloped, and I hit the dirt and slid into the ditch line beside the road. I looked up behind me. All I saw was a large, brownish-red head and shoulders. The head looked human, and I could tell from a glance that it stood around eight feet tall. It stopped, and it didn't come down beside me, and I made it home, having never been back there. I told my wife that night and went back into the woods the next summer, but not in that area. On to the next one. In Shoshone County in Idaho, I was doing some clearing at our property with a weed whacker and a chainsaw. I had been up for half the morning and felt like something was watching me. I thought I heard noises like something was moving in the woods nearby. I called my dog, but he ran full speed under my car. I spent 10 minutes trying to get him out and put him in my car. We sat there and I still felt like we were being watched. So I left and came back the next day, and things felt fine. There was no sighting of a creature, just movement sound. On to the next one. I was riding four-wheelers with four other people, so five total, south of Berea, Kentucky. It's a place that people go to ride four-wheelers and off-road vehicles. It's called Buffalo. I will say before tonight, I didn't believe in Bigfoot, 
or primates roaming around in the woods. I didn't believe in no person coming across them or game and wildlife people finding them, but tonight has changed that. We rode to a spot called Lookout Mountain, and from this spot, you can see Richmond and Barra. On the way out there, we stopped to talk on the quads. We turned them off, and things were fine. All of a sudden, the crickets stopped chirping, and it became so silent. Our friend noticed the silence. At this moment, a log was thrown. We were scared at this moment, but 15 seconds later, a huge limestone slab was thrown from the hillside toward us with massive force. It's 4 a.m. now, and I can't sleep thinking about it. I'm baffled right now, in shock. It appears that Joshua reported this event right after it happened, and he was still in a state of shock and confusion. Sometimes the realization that there is indeed something out there living in the forest is overwhelming. On to the next one. In Madison County in Montana, this is the first place in Montana that gold was discovered. So there is a monument short way up the gulch. I was 16 years old at the time and my cousin was 25. So quite a few years have passed since this sighting happened. My grandfather's cabins are about 8 to 10 miles up Alder Gulch on the road to the ridge is another mile and a half from my grandfather's cabin. My grandfather no longer owns the cabin. On that morning, my dad, my uncle, cousin, and I awoke in preparation for opening day of deer season. After spending the night in my grandfather's cabin in Alder Gulch, we geared up for an early morning hunt. My cousin and I rode in the back of my uncle's pickup truck with my dad riding shotgun. We planned on hitting the ridge to the west of my grandfather's cabin. We had to drive about two miles south, or as I would call it, up Alder Gulch to get to the road that goes to the ridge. We missed the turn up to the ridge road, but quickly realized our error. Upon finding the correct road, we progressed up the gradual slope, climbing and meandering through the mostly pine and meadows dominated by waist-high sagebrush. Of course, being opening deer season, my cousin and I were being vigilant, scanning every opening and meadow. My cousin and I were hanging on to the cab of my uncle's truck due to a slight uphill grade. To our right was an open hillside meadow covered with thigh-high sagebrush surrounded by pine trees. We both were scanning the meadow when my cousin said, there's another hunter, slight pause. Why is he wearing all black? All I could do was stare and keep staring. My cousin looked over at me because I had not said anything. We both viewed the animal for about 10 seconds. About 250 yards out in the sagebrush meadow was a Bigfoot. We banged on the cab so my uncle would stop. The pickup came to a quick stop, and as luck would have it, there were pine trees blocking our view from the sagebrush meadow. We immediately said to back up. As we backed up, my cousin and I expected to see Bigfoot still in the meadow, but there was no sight of him or her. We both looked at each other in disbelief and questioned each other as to what we saw. Make no bones about it. The animal had the distinctive dome-shaped head with no neck, broad shoulders, and a solid back. The animal was facing us and was slightly bent forward and looked as if it was resting its arm on its right knee. It occurred to me that he or she knew it got caught out in the open and was just going to stay motionless and hoped we would drive right by. The closest tree line was about 50 yards away from the Bigfoot and it had taken us only about 15 seconds to get back to where we could see the sagebrush meadow again. We didn't see the Bigfoot again. We didn't tell our dads until later and just kept it to ourselves. My cousin and I continued our hunt that morning with a constant thought in the back of our minds of what we saw earlier. 
We did separate from each other as we hunted the ridge, and I did get an eerie feeling that I was being watched. Hustling to find my cousin down the ridge and put the feelings of being watched behind me, I heard a gunshot. My cousin did get a nice mule deer buck. This was about two to two and a half miles from our sighting. I have hunted most of my life and have seen most animals that live in these woods. My cousin has been hunting all his life and knows every animal there is in the woods as well. We will never forget that morning and talk about it with each other occasionally. I hope to possibly get another chance to witness another Bigfoot and get one on video. After the sighting, I had a feeling of being watched. There was no snow at the time. It was only myself and my cousin. We were both scanning the sagebrush meadow looking for deer on opening day of deer season. It was early morning, approximately 6 a.m. and a clear sky. The sun was up enough to see well. Sunny 50 degrees and no wind. The elevation was 7,000 to 8,000 feet in a pine and for forest with steep slopes. There are intermittent sagebrush meadows with grass meadows as well. Alder Creek is below my grandfather's cabin with plenty of mountain streams in the area. On to the next one. I lived seven miles west of Sydney, Montana. I was traveling home one night after work at approximately 11.30 p.m. The weather was cold below zero. Light snow was drifting across the highway. The terrain is rolling hills with no trees other than what is planted by the local farmhouses. I came upon what we call a coulee where the road is built up between the rolling hills and has a guardrail the length of the coulee. What has to be a Bigfoot crossed the road in front of me at the end of the guardrails headed north. He was well over six foot tall. He didn't even turn his head to look at me. He just walked across the road. His stature was the same as the Bigfoot that was filmed in the woods that was on sighting, the Patterson-Gimlin film. Maybe the only difference I saw was that his hair was not extremely long or matted, but lightly colored, and the wind was whipping it though, and it was darker at the skin than at the tip. I was 17 years old and was traveling alone and you can just imagine the fear that caused. I regret not stopping there the next day to look for prints in the snow, but it was such a terrifying experience I could not bring myself to stop. It was approximately 11.30 p.m. and the weather was cold below zero. Light snow was drifting across the highway. The area was rolling hills with no trees other than what is planted by the local farmhouse. On to the next one. Near Great Falls in Cascade County in Montana. The event took place approximately 40 miles south of Great Falls, Montana, in the Dearborn River area, about 12 miles back in the woods on Upper Sawmill Creek. During the night, horrible smells were noticed. The smells were shortly accompanied by strange very loud warbling noises which circled the cabin where four friends were spending the night. One person, my aunt, taped these sounds on a portable tape recorder. These sounds were never sent to be analyzed. The four people who smelled and heard the whatever were settling down for the night, some already asleep. In this area, there is no electricity, no phones, no running water. No alcohol or drugs were taken by any of the witnesses prior to the event, nor has my aunt ever taken drugs and hasn't drank for many years. It was dry with not many deciduous trees, mostly conifers. Small creeks are nearby, about 5,000 elevation. It is dense forest, accessible only by snowmobiling in the winter, four by four the rest of the year. Small mountains make up the front range of the Rocky Mountain. The nearest inhabited property is about three miles away. 
on to the next one. The Tinglet, Southeast Alaska Coast Native. Among some of the Tinglet lore in which Bigfoot and Sasquatch-like creatures are held is the belief that these beings are either lost, drowned, or deceased family members which have come back as a hairy form of human, also referred to as a kushtaka. For this reason, Tinglet belief holds that general regard not to shoot at a kushtaka whenever spotted. There are many recent observations of passive sightings of kushtakas among locals to the area of the southeast Alaska coast in the 2003 book Raincoast Sasquatch, written by Robert Alley. The tinglet also refer to Bigfoot or Sasquatch as Land Otter Man, which has the ability to swim and uses watershed where it never has to go too far to get fresh water, as well as intertidal areas of the coast to its advantage. There, it gathers various foods, food sources such as abalone, fish, crab, and different kinds of shellfish. When one considers the rugged expanse of coastline to this area of southeast Alaska, they must not only consider the mainland coast, but the amount of additional coastline that comes off of each island from off the mainland. When one adds up all of the total miles of coastline from each island of this region of southeast Alaska to the total number of miles of mainland coast, it becomes a much larger amount of coastland miles altogether. Miles in which this creature also uses as it swims from island to island, staying hidden and gathering an endlessly abundant supply of fresh seafood. Observation of modern occurrences of Kushtaka on many southeast Alaskan islands are vigorously noted. In the book Rainco Sasquatch, several observations of the creature's swim pattern are also mentioned by eyewitnesses, including more than one account of the creature climbing aboard actual fishing boats. This is probably another classic example of Sasquatch trying to make an attempt at getting fish that have already been caught. Fremont, Anasazi, and Archaic Period Hunter-Gatherers These early advanced indigenous groups thrived throughout Utah and near the surrounding areas of the Four Corners region where corners of Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico all meet, of the desert southwest. From a book written in 2006 by Lisa A. Scheel, titled Backyard Bigfoot, there is mention of an archaeological site with stone-inscribed pictographs, which was at one time home to the Fremont tribe in Utah. Evidence seems to suggest that the Fremont had once flourished here as far back as 400 A.D. and as recent as 1450 A.D. In the book, the author notes of an anthropomorphic or human-like figure found portrayed on stone at a location in Utah known as Dry Fork Canyon. As Shield notes, the huge figure belongs to a class dubbed anthropomorphic figures. When archaeologists fail to find a rational, normal explanation for a figure, they label it anthropomorphic, which means the figure resembles a human being, yet also has features unlike any human. The pictograph shows a number of big foot drawings, right before a hunter, which is depicted as having a bow and arrow, raised before a deer, which he is attempting to kill. The deer appears to be balanced on its hind legs with its front hooves raised at the ghastly sight of the two huge bodies which are in front of and on the opposite side of the deer from the hunter as if they were waiting in ambush. The bodies of these two man-like beings are depicted as much larger than the deer hunter. These creatures are depicted as being human-shaped on two legs, very tall half as wide as they are tall, with big chests, 
no neck, and with a set of horns on their head. The very big human-like footprints which these pictographs also depict, which are scattered all about and throughout this pictograph before and after the hunter is confronted by these two creatures, seems to suggest game sign of these creature which the hunter again had apparently also seen before and or after finally being confronted by these mountain devils, stepping out while he was apparently out doing his hunting. This is still a common observation or occurrence among many hunters, fishers, and outdoors men and women in our more modern time who often come across big man-like footprints while out doing some of these same or similar sorts of activities outdoors. As also occurs in instances that involve people working deeper into mountains and wilderness areas, or situations where people may be in these areas for more than one day at a time. These descriptions correlate well with Bigfoot and Sasquatch being a hunter as well as a territorial animal, much like chimps who must protect their food sources from neighboring rivals like monkeys. In this case, the creatures are much more lenient at getting their message across by warning, by leaving a giant footprint behind and eventually stepping out to scare off others who may be threatening its food supply. In this case, deer is the food source. In her book, she'll mention that there is a broad array of pictograph sites throughout the four corner regions where Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado all meet that have depictions of very large, similarly inscribed human-like feet on display. She then notes the details of these footprints as being portrayed as wider than a human footprint. Bigfoot and Sasquatch footprints are still today commonly recognized as being wider than a human print. Human footprints are on average three to three and a half times as long as they are wide. Sasquatch footprints are on average only about twice as long as they are wide, like the creature itself. The horns depicted on these creatures' heads in the pictograph is another thing that's very interesting, and the term mountain devil is used then again and again throughout history to describe these animals among both First Nations and some of the early settlers. It is the above-described rock painting of one of the earliest depictions of mountain devils by Native Americans. It certainly seems suggestive and relative by the horns, which are depicted on the heads of both of these giants. As Sheil also notes in her book, while no sighting that I am aware of mentions hairy hominids having horns, the appendages shown on the petroglyphs may represent the artist's attempt to ensure the viewers that the creatures are fearsome. The following portion of the book relates to the culture of the Anasazi, which soon followed about 300 years after the Fremont. They, like the Fremont, had also lived throughout the Four Corners region, the Four Corner region of the desert southwest, and had also constructed many apartment-like dwellings in many of the areas they had occupied. According to S.H.I.E.L.D., Anasazi had thrived in this region from 700 to 1300 A.D. Like the Fremont, the Anasazi had also created very large volumes of pictographs portraying various anthropomorphic figures. She'll note some of the following descriptions of the anthropomorphic figures found on the pictographs as follows. Many have wide shoulders, little to no neck, bulky heads, and builds any sumo wrestler would envy. Some have tapered waist, but all have the broad-shouldered appearance of Bigfoot some even conical heads. Hands and feet, when depicted, are often quite large. Their shoulders are so broad that it defies logic to think the artist intended to depict humans. Similar rock-inscribed artwork, which predates both Anasazi and Fairmont cultures, these drawings are from the Archaic period, which was from 1500 to 3000 years ago. A culture older than the Anasazi, known simply as the Archaic Period Hunter-Gatherers, 
created ghostly figures who also bear an uncanny resemblance to hairy hominids. In a 1976 documentary film by Ivan Mark titled The Legend of Bigfoot, there is a reference to the long-departed Anasazi tribe that some of the pictographs, which can be found on the inside walls of some of their petrified wood homes, these Anasazi dwellings have some rather interesting pictographs of very big feet and hands connected to human-like bodies with very long arms in what the documentary movie refers to as the land of petrified wood in Arizona. As the story in the movie explains, the stickmen, as they were called, would reach into some of the First Nations dwellings and steal Anasazi babies at night. Another thing that seems very fascinating and rather too coincidental is the idea that Anasazi had also laid claim through these depictions, that human creatures would actually reach through their windows and steal their babies at night, according to the 2011 National Geographic episode titled The Hunt for the Abominable Snowman, the Sherpa natives, who live in the high reaches of the Himalaya mountains on the other side of the world, which also lays claim to their story to the Yeti, which was later termed to be the Abominable Snowman, have very small windows, which are said to keep out what was also referred to as the living dead at night. Could this be yet another example of Bigfoot Sasquatch's elusiveness and cultures failing to make a connection between two different things, which are really one and the same? It certainly seems suggestive given the highly elusive nature of these animals today, as well as stories which ancient rock paintings of the Anasazi, Fremont, and archaic period hunter-gatherers also seem to suggest. On to the next one. A young man, 16 years of age, was driving home from his girlfriend's house near Palmyra in Montgomery County just before midnight. Going down a hill, he saw what he thought was a deer on the side of the road. It was brown, real hairy, and was on all fours. He thought that it was a pretty big deer. He slowed down, thinking he was going to get a good look at the deer and was only 100 yards from it when it stood up on two feet and ran into the woods. It scared the daylights out of him. There was a real foul smell at the time as well. On to the next one. Ten miles south of Middleton, in Hardman County in Tennessee, I was deer hunting alone and had been in my stand about 15 minutes when I heard someone approaching. I spoke loudly that this was private land when a smell of a heavy, musky smell hit me, and whatever it was began to run circles around me, about 75 yards away. I could see a dark shape but it was misty and still a little dark. After about four to five minutes, it turned and ran off. No one has ever believed me, but I encountered the smell several other times, which I can say smelled like a wet bear, which I now pursue frequently. That was the only time where I felt not in control, even though I had my rifle. The animal was seen. What I saw was a dark form in mist, that sounded to run on two legs. It was 6 to 7 a.m. and overcast. The witness did relate other stories he had heard from the area. He related that a local fellow had dogs killed in the area. The dogs had the hide pulled off them. The area was bottomland woods with many beaver ponds and a drainage canal running through it. He said that He'd also heard that when the canal was being constructed, workers had a problem with their tools being moved at night. After construction, a man was paid to stay in the area to maintain the unobstructed flow of the canal. Something supposedly shook the little shack he lived in one night. 
the man left and refused to return. On to the next one. In Giles County, around 10 p.m., the primary witness and their father were driving along when they spotted something run across the road in front of them. There were high winds at the time, and the father, who was driving, was finding it hard to keep the car on the road. It looked like a bear, but had human features. The mother in the back seat of the car did not see it as she had looked down for a moment. The witness believed that the Bigfoot was looking for shelter during the storm. The creature was six feet tall and weighed 300 pounds. They at first thought that it was a bear, but because it was always running upright made them realize it was something else. It was very muscular with dark brown coarse hair. On to the next one. Near Dryersburg in Dryer County, two male friends were driving down the Lanes Ferry Highway around 5 a.m. when they came around a curve and saw something run across the road. It was illuminated by their headlight. They both agreed that it was a baby Bigfoot. He was four to five feet tall and his arms were swinging when he ran across the road from one cow pasture to another, headed toward the bluff and the Ohio River. The body was not slim, and the dark brown hair comparable in length and textured to an old English sheepdog. On to the next one. About four to five miles west of Chestnut Bluff in Hales Point Bottom, my husband, my brother-in-law, and I were riding toward the Mississippi River at about 8.30 p.m. that night. We were in a car, my husband was driving, and I was sitting in the middle, my brother-in-law sitting beside the passenger door. As we were going down Highway 88, I saw a creature that was about seven feet tall and weighed about 245 pounds. It was completely but lightly covered with dark brown or black long hair. As we were riding and our car lights hit it, I saw it on the right side of the road. It stood there for a moment, observing the oncoming car. I stared at it, and it stared back at me for a brief moment. As I was looking at its eyes, I noticed a reddish tint. His features reminded me of a cross between an ape and a man. It was standing upright on two feet, and like a human, it ran across the road. The speed with which it ran across was unlike any I have ever known. I asked my brother-in-law if he had seen it. He said he saw something cross the road, but it was so fast he thought it was maybe a deer. He couldn't say for sure what it was because he was carrying on a conversation with my husband. Still, to this day, I will not go down there after dark. This was near Halls in Lauderdale County in Tennessee. On to the next one. Two hunters became aware of something noisily making its way through some brush about 50 yards away. Thinking that it was too large to be a deer, they simultaneously viewed from their tree stand a large, hairy, seven-foot-tall creature walking across an old logging trail. Before they could do anything, the creature suddenly tore through the forest away from them. This was at Short Mountain in Cannon County. On to the next one. In Hawkins County in Tennessee, Kenneth Elmore reported seeing the creature while driving home from church Sunday evening at about nine, the creature crossed the road in front of Mr. Elmore and it was seen in the car's headlight. Elmore described the creature as five to six feet in height, having dark hair and glowing eyes. Gladys Peterson reported seeing a similar creature 
as she was driving her car later that week on Wednesday at about 5.30 in the evening. Again, the creature crossed the road in front of an approaching vehicle. Peterson described the creature as about five feet in height, having no black hair. No tracks or any other evidence, such as hair, were found at either of the two sites where the creature was seen. A man, Phil, accidentally found five-toed tracks, which measured approximately 13 inches long and six inches wide in a dry creek bed while he was out working his squirrel dog. This was in Smith Creek, which is located approximately one to two miles from the Peterson sighting and about seven miles from the Elmore sighting. Apparently, Smith Creek was muddy when the creature went through, leaving a half mile of tracks to follow. Horace Smith brought his hound dogs to sniff out where the creature disappeared, but the dogs would not follow the tracks. Jeffrey Bryant, an interested Bigfoot researcher of Kingston, North Carolina, made plaster casts of a few of the tracks. Bryant told me that where the sightings and tracks were found bordered the fringes of the wilderness. Bryant noted that the tracks had peculiar bulges on them and that the big toe was spaced further apart from the other four. The stride measured from 46 to 52 inches and appeared to Bryant the creature had movable toes. The casts were submitted to physical anthropologist Dr. David Stadium of Duke University for analysis. Dr. Stadium dismissed them as fake because, according to him, there are no bones. Therefore, there is no such animal as Bigfoot that exists. Since Bigfoot does not exist, the plaster casts are fake. On to the next one. Finding a Bigfoot print or trackway is an unusual thing indeed. Finding physical evidence such as hair, blood, or scat of a Bigfoot creature is rarer still. Given that so few examples exist, and presuming that great care is taken in both preserving the provenance and ensuring the safekeeping of that evidence, we must ask why so much Bigfoot evidence simply goes missing. Cindy Dawson related the issue of disappearing hair samples to Toby Johnson. When Johnson sent his sample to Dawson for analysis, he was advised to take special care in mailing the evidence. Dawson had noted a problem with previous samples sent her way disappearing in the mail, for whatever reason. Vanishing hair samples were also a problem for Stan Gordon. In August of 1973, Pennsylvania was in the middle of a wave of Bigfoot and UFO sightings, which would keep Gordon and his team of investigators busy for years. One of Gordon's associates, identified as Ken R., responded to a Bigfoot sighting in Mongolia, Pennsylvania, and obtained two foul-smelling hair samples. Ken let his dog sniff at the samples and saw it cower at the scent. Ken R. mailed one hair sample along with his report describing the incident to Gordon and phoned to let Stan know the package was on its way. Ken had mailed that envelope personally from his local post office. The missive never reached Gordon. After a few days, Gordon telephoned Ken to inquire about the package. It should have arrived. Ken mailed a second copy of the report. This, too, never arrived. While they were discussing these events, another phone conversation between Ken and Stan was interrupted by loud, metallic, electronic sounds. The interference was loud enough to drown out the conversation. Gordon noted that this interference became somewhat common. It would happen whenever he discussed Bigfoot creature sightings over the telephone. Suspecting their mail was being intercepted, Ken R. eventually hand-delivered the second hair sample to Gordon. However, that isn't the last time Bigfoot evidence gathered by Ken would go missing. Ken R. kept all of his Bigfoot report and evidence in a filing cabinet at his home. In the same file, Ken also kept personal 
and family information. One day, around the same time as the mailed hair sample and reports went missing, Ken went to retrieve his Bigfoot files from the cabinet. Anything concerning the creature was gone. All of Ken's reports and witness interviews had vanished. All other files detailing personal and family information remained untouched. Melba Ketchum herself suggested some Sasquatch Genome Project evidence effectively disappeared by other researchers. When taken to an independent laboratory to verify the results, the samples revealed a mix of DNA from opossum and other known animals. Ketchum alleges the samples may have been switched. Various Bigfoot investigators have claimed factions within the United States government for unknown reasons confiscate or destroy evidence of Sasquatch. The government knows Bigfoot exists. These investigators assert their reason why authorities deny the creature's existence varies from individual to individual, ranging from Bigfoot's existence negatively impacting the logging industry to the idea that people would be fearfully avoiding visiting national parks if they knew Bigfoot was out there. Exposing a vast government conspiracy covering up Bigfoot reality may be as difficult as proving the creatures themselves exist. The idea of a government cover-up of giant creatures extends at least as far back as the 1800. Newspapers from the 19th to the early 20th century frequently reported discoveries of giant, eight-foot-tall-plus human skeletons throughout North America. These bones, in most cases, do not appear to be Bigfoot remains. Occasional photos and descriptions of the bones seem to indicate these skeletons came from a very tall race of humans. The giant skeletons were found, according to the articles, in burial, burial mounds and tombs throughout America, sometimes accompanied by large, heavy tools or weapons. Nearly without exception, the giant skeleton newspaper report consistently mentioned that the bones would be taken to some institution, usually the Smithsonian Institution. These articles have fed modern-day theories that the Smithsonian has select warehouses containing these giant skeletons, or, alternatively, that the institution actually destroys these skeletons. Again, the motives vary, but most often, the reason provided is that these giant skeletons do not conform to accepted science. Assuming these skeletons did exist, the fact remains they have been confiscated, so only a select or chosen few may know the truth, or they have been destroyed. Alleged Bigfoot bones, another primary relic, met a similar fate, Dr. Robert W. Denton was on a Boy Scout outing near Mammoth, California in July 1965 when a pack mule tethered in a boggy area near their camp kicked up a piece of skull. The skull was human-like but extraordinarily large and heavy. It appeared unusually long with an occipital ridge higher than found on modern humans. Denton sent the skull to Dr. Gerald K. Ridge a Ventura County pathologist for identification. Ridge found the skull was so unusual he wondered if it had come from an anthropod species other than human. He passed the skull along to two scientists at the University of California, Los Angeles, Dr. Billip Thrull and Dr. Prost, but by 1973 the skull had disappeared. Several inquiries were made regarding the location of the skull. Apparently, the specimen was never turned into the museum for cataloging. If it had been, we would have recorded it, UCLA anthropologist professor Clement Megan replied by letter. I'm sorry, we don't seem able to find the skull, but this is the first I have heard of it. Clay Singer, the UCLA museum technician, followed up a few weeks later. I've tried to be as exhaustive as possible in an attempt to locate the skull fragment, he said. I have personally questioned everyone in the department who might know something about it, 
including former museum technicians as far back as 1964. Nobody has seen it since mid-1965. I have also carefully checked every burial and a sentient skull in our collection without result. When Billib Trull was questioned about the specimen, he replied that he had no record nor recollection of the skull. I'm sorry, but I don't remember it, Billib Trull wrote. Prost answered similarly, stating he had no memory of anyone giving him a skull of any kind while he was at UCLA, nor of even having such a skull in his lab. How does such an unusual, important, and potentially groundbreaking specimen as the Denton skull simply disappear? Why do so many of the parties involved have difficulty even remembering the skull, much less locating it? Modern science is so quick to criticize Bigfoot encounters and demand physical evidence, but why is it when physical evidence appears, it mysteriously goes missing? It definitely seems there's something going on behind the scenes. What are your theories? Let's start the discussion in the comments down below. What do you guys think is going on? I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!